please welcome Mr. Justin Brown. Hey team, it's me again. Just kidding, great to see you all. Um, and incredibly excited to have uh, this conversation which goes back uh, many, many years. Uh, I've known Mr. Ben Bow for I guess about a decade. A little now. over a decade, probably about 12 years, yeah. Yeah, so I first met Drew. Um, he came into VA. Uh, essentially, I, I was doing congressional affairs for the Department of Veterans Affairs and uh, walk into the office one day and Drew was very in my space and that he was, you know, his desk was literally in front of my office. <laughs> and uh, I was like, who is this guy? And um, yeah, we had quite a first day. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, as Justin said, it's been about a decade, a little over a decade, and he's, you know, I was fresh out of, I had just gotten back from a deployment, you know, brand new, st straight out of law school before that, and I was green. I was green in D.C. It was my first federal job, and Justin took me under his wing, took me to the Hill, and um, and eventually started uh, Hillvets, and I'm, I'm, I'm astounded every time I look at everything that um, you've done with Hillvets in terms of uh, getting, it, getting it off the ground. And this is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous organization and I'm proud to be here and I'm proud to know you. Well, I appreciate that, Drew. And Drew's being humble. He actually uh, you know, was a big part and player of Hillvets and did a lot of work with us on the front end to, to actually make this an organization. Um, you know, it was very scrappy at the beginning, as I've kind of said or insinuated uh, multiple times, but we just continued to stick with it. Um, at one juncture, I, this is one of my, my funnier stories with Drew. He had gone on deployment, and um, I asked him to come uh, join me for, for a photo shoot because the Military Times was going to run a story. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> he would just gotten back from deployment, and I'm like, hey, show up to, to the Capitol. Uh, we're going to do a photo shoot with Military Times. They're running a story on Hill Vets. And he was like, oh, totally, I'll be there. And he shows up, and, and we, you know, I got the permission from John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, to use his balcony. And you know, John, John Lewis is one of the most incredible human beings I've had the opportunity to meet. And of course, they let us use his balcony for this photo shoot. Well, they take the photos and they they they, they put Hillvets on the cover, but it's just Drew. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, we, we did have a joint photo on the interior of the other magazine. I don't uh, remember a joint photo, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to say it's, Drew's it's still on my wall right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but Drew. You know, I was so incredibly uh, excited for you when I learned that you were going to go down um, this road of, of, of writing a book. You know, I, I guess, where, where did this come from? I mean, sure, yeah. sure. So we were in the throes of COVID and, you know, we, no happy hours, no, you know, dinners, none of that stuff. We were in the house and um, I, had a, I had a tremendous amount of time on my hands just like most of us did and I was observing the world uh, you know we were you know in the midst of the racial rec uh, reckoning and uh, and the protests and all these things were happening around me and I was trying to make sense of those things and I began to write about it just sort of as an outlet as a release valve so to speak and I didn't realize I was writing a book I didn't realize I was writing a novel but eventually about 5,000 words in I begin to notice some natural chapter breaks. And I thought, hey, I'm writing a book. I'm writing a novel. And before I knew it, one chapter turned to two, two turned to 10, and I had the draft of The Devil's Politics. So maybe let's back up a little bit. Tell, tell us a little bit about Drew Bembo be, before you ended up with a desk in front of my office. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I'm from Washington, D.C., born and raised, Southeast D.C., uh, Anacostia, to be uh, precise. And where I grew up, I grew up at a time when D.C. was the murder and drug capital of the United States for several consecutive years. I mean, it was a really uh, tough time. And uh, I joined the Army out of a uh, profound sense of patriotism and brokenness, right? And uh, I, I ended up joining the Army in the year 2000 and, um, and deployed a few times, came back, ended up 
uh, going to college at Hampton University and decided, hey, I, you know, I, I, did, I was a political science major. I wanted to, wanted to, um, to study law, I went to law school. And you know, that's how I ended up, you know, I deployed after that to Afghanistan, did 13 months after, you know, to Afghanistan, came back, and that's where I met you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what, what was kind of a key, so there was COVID, but I guess in terms of the, the plot line of the book, what was yeah. really your inspiration? By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm two-thirds of the way through the book. Really? I, really? I, I don't want to talk about it too much. You, you all should read the book. I'm being genuine when I'm telling you it's, it's a great read. Um, yeah, so... But I'm, I'm at a tough part, not to interrupt you, but I'm going to interrupt you. I'm at, I, I'm at a tough part where, like, Maybe one of the main character dies, but I don't know. Okay. So I, I, I ended it there last night, and okay. I was like, oh, shit. Like, now I'm not going to be able to sleep. Yeah, yeah. And well, I got to wake up at 8, you know, to be at this thing at 8 a.m. tomorrow. That is a beautiful compliment, especially coming from you, Justin. So um, the devil's politics, I'll just go into a little bit of the plot. You have uh, a pair of black male twin, identical twin brothers from the South, Damien who, and Devon. Damien and Devon. Mm -hmm. they, they start out in the same place in Georgia, and they go on two diverging paths. One, Damien is deemed a bad apple from the start, gets into a lot of trouble, ends up joining the army. The other, pretty responsible, goes into, you know, does well in school, goes to law school, can't pass the bar, but he ends up working for a Republican member of Congress. They both are presented with opportunities job opportunities that neither of them can refuse from two unscrupulous uh, characters, I'd say. And, um, and they have to come to terms with that. And it tests their brotherhood. It tests their fidelity to each other. Um, um, but be, uh, in addition to all that, uh, more, more than the storyline, this is a political manifesto, right? This book is a political manifesto of how I imagine um, black participation in the, uh, in the American political system. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, cause you, you delve into some, you delve into some tough yeah, topics yeah, in the book. Yeah. I go into some, I go into some tough topics about, because we, we in this country as black people, I think that we vote exclusively one party. And I think that, uh, that not only works to our detriment as a people, but the detriment of the United States as a whole, because we know that diversity is um, diversity is good for everybody. It's not just good for the individual groups. Diversity of ideology is good for everyone. And so I wrote this book. I, I, you know, military officer, law school. I could have written a treatise. I could have gone and written a professorial, you know, treatment of the topic. But that's boring. Right? Nobody cares about that. I wanted to write something. I wanted to create art. I wanted to create art with a message. You, when, when you came up with the idea of Hill Vets, you, um, you recognized that there was a gap. There was a gap that needed to be filled. And, um, and when I came up with the idea for the devil's politics, it was me observing the world, recognizing that there is a gap that needed to be filled. We vote exclusively one party. And I think that's bad for us, and I think it's bad for uh, the American political system as a whole. And I think yeah. that we should change that. Republicans should court our vote and Democrats alike. This isn't an indictment on any political party. It's not an indictment on the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It is, uh, it is a, a suggestion of... Well, it wasn't an implication on the issues either, yeah. right? It was, right. you know, I think, I think what you did with that was actually very insightful Thank and you. very thoughtful. And it certainly made me... <clears throat> Think about the issue in another way, which sure. was, you know, there's been this historical, well, because of this, you should do this, sure. which in some ways, you know, if, if, if it's just assumed you're going to vote one way, it kind of takes away that voice in some ways. There, there's no doubt about it, right? So the Democrats, when the Democrats court our vote, they're not coming to us saying, hey, vote for us because they're saying vote because they know that when we go to the polls, they already know who we're going to vote for, right? The Republicans, they don't court our vote at all because they already know that we're going to vote for the Democrats. And um, I think that's, that's a huge problem because what happens is there's no competition for the black vote. Imagine, imagine if 
Apple were the only smartphone maker in the game. There would be no incentive for Apple to you know, make a faster processor or, in, or better camera, right? But because you have Samsung and Android in the game, when one makes a, cam a phone that can go three meters deep, another one, they have to one-up each other and make, make a phone that goes six meters deep, I don't know. But who wins is the consumer. Mm -hmm. Competition is good. What's not happening is we're not having competition for the black vote, and it's keeping a whole segment of the population out of the discourse that's, in, that's important for, for, for this country. Yeah, pun intended, devil's advocate. Um, is, that, is, that, is that also starting to happen with kind of an urban, urban versus rural vibe? Um, there's no doubt about it, but um, if you think about where we as black people live in this country, we live in highly densely populated areas, Chicago, sure. you know, Fulton County, Atlanta, you know, um, Philly, D.C., right? We're, we, sure, we have, there are quite a few of us who live in, in, in rural areas, but we are concentrated in the densely populated areas. Yeah. And so if, like, if you look at Georgia, for example, and all the, um, the voter laws that are happening down there, so you have um, Republican governor who is, um, who, you know, think about the voting boxes, during 2020 elections, there were voting boxes. People, there was a lot of access to voting, and so you saw uh, you saw you know election results that were um, that were uh, surprising to a lot of people. Mm. Well, now a lot of these voting boxes are being taken away because um, because the, these voting boxes were in you know I guess like Fulton County and lots of like black neighborhoods, and um, and they're being taken away because. They know that when we go to the polls, we're not going to vote for the Republicans. And if they knew that we were going to vote, if they knew that they had a chance of at least getting our vote, then they would compete for our vote. You wouldn't have the voting box issue or any, any of those other issues. Drew's been spending a lot of time on court TV lately, yep. uh, which is always exciting to see your, 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 your good friend <laughs> popping up on court TV. Um, how's that been? I mean, it's been a bit of a whirlwind you these know, like, last yeah. few months. Yeah, you know, you so. You write the book. Do you feel like it's really kind of elevated you in terms of? Um... So I, th I think it's, it's kind of um, art imitating life. So there's a section in that book, and you remember where, um, where Devon, one of the main characters, he's thrust into the spotlight. He had never been, he was a low-level staffer, and all of a sudden he's like the press secretary for this member of Congress. He's suddenly on national news. He's suddenly on national news. Yeah. Same here. I had never been on TV, and he gets on there, and he's like this bumbling fool initially, and eventually he gets better uh, over time and becomes just sort of a, a master at it, not to give anything away. But um, I felt that way. My first time on national TV, I was I'm sitting in my, my, my gym in my house, you know, with the computer. I can't, see my, I can't see who I'm talking to. I can only see my face. And... Um, and it was a stressful thing for me, and it, it kind of um, tested my confidence. My confidence was shaken, but eventually um, I started to do more, and I got, I got a little bit better with it. But, um, yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you something, kind of, I'm always interested, and I, I actually asked the congressman, uh, Congressman Mast from Florida yesterday. He's a double amputee veteran, incredible recovery that was basically like, you know, got blown up and then I'm going to run for Congress and, like, and recover and like, yeah. did all those things. Who, who was the first person you told you are like, going to write a book? And, and how did it go? All right. So that's, that's a, an incredible question. I won't say his name, but and it'll be apparent in a second. But, excuse me, I told a friend of mine, love him to death, and I said, I want to write a book, I want to get it published, and I want to see it as a series, a, 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 a Netflix series. And, um, and he gave me the worst advice I could ever receive. <laughs> yeah. Right? The worst advice. And the worst advice I've ever received is be realistic. Ooh. Right? Be realistic. I know you have these ideas. I know this is what you want to do, but be realistic. And when, in, when anyone tells you to be realistic, essentially what they're doing is saying that what you want to do, it's not real for them. Yeah. And because it's not real for them, 
it shouldn't be real for the, you. They're trying to temper your expectations, temper your their goals, and and your um, and your uh, and your 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 ambitions. And um, I still love him. He loves me to that. He was yeah. it was well intended. Right. 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 But, right. Right. But that was the response I got. Yeah, and I've I've, I've seen that so many times. I've seen um, you know often when I ask people that question with regards to big projects yeah. um, that they realized yeah. right that ultimately um, happened. Part of the challenge is is communicating that to people and and hoping for support. Sure. Right. I think aligned with advice, but oftentimes what you get back is actually not helpful. Oh yeah, absolutely. You have to protect your you have to protect your, yourself from that because if you get caught, if, had I taken that advice, I would have stopped writing the devil's politics after chapter eight or nine. Right. right? And I would have thought, hey, this is not realistic. It's unrealistic that I'd have a physical hard copy bestseller, right, book on my hands. And um, and my next step is getting a, a series and on one of the major one of the major streaming services and that's realistic for me now. Yeah. Where are you at right now on Amazon? I know you're you know, I keep so, seeing the number so, drop, so, so which, I, so which I guess I, in the book business is good, right? The number needs to come down. Yeah, but. so I, I, at one point I reached, the highest I reached was number 13 of all political fiction right. movie releases. Yeah, <laughs> it's really incredible. Yeah. So, uh, so hopefully, hopefully we'll push this thing up to, uh, to number one and keep it there for a while. Yeah. You know, I think <clears throat> I've certainly thought about writing a book, um, and, you know, it always seems fraught with peril to yeah. me <laughs> in so many ways. Like, it just, it sounds like such an undertaking. I mean, um, I, feel, I feel like for me it's like that question of I have run for office, and I get that question often, you know, like, what is it like to run for office? And I think, I think those are kind of two things that are not uncommon in at least this kind of policy DC space that people have thought about, but I think only the, a margin of people actually, you know, end up jumping into it sure. and, and actually doing the thing. Um, what, what advice would you have for somebody that's kind of, you know, teetering on that, that edge of, you know, they think they've got a book in them, um, you know, and I'll, I'll add one, one post to that as well. Chuck Hagel always tells me, and it's, it's more of, I think, how much he respects individuals, sure. but he always tells me, you know, Justin, I don't think I've ever met a person that's not at least good for one book. There's no doubt about and, it. And what he means by that is just, you know, people's stories matter, yeah. right? But that's kind of an aside. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to somebody? There's, there's no doubt about it. Everybody has at least one book, and then we all have life experiences. We've seen everything in the devil's politics. Yeah, this is a fictional book. This is a, a, a novel but everything in this book is rooted either in historical fact or something that I've experienced or observed, right? I just built a story around it. Now, um, I would say get started. You, you have to get started and write anything, right? Whatever it is that you, you feel like writing and just write. You can't spend too much time thinking or else you'll end up in what they call analysis paralysis right. and you'll go nowhere. And then once you finish writing that book and it's time to get it out there, and you, you're looking for agents, you're looking for publishers, you're going to get rejected. But more, but more painful than being rejected is being flat out ignored. Right? So you're going <laughs> right, right. to send out all these what they call query letters and try to get what are they called again? query letters, the query letters. Where, you're, okay. where you're writing, trying to solicit representation from an agent. And they will, they will flat out ignore you. Some will respond, but you're going to get a lot of rejections. And eventually, um, eventually, if it's if it's a good enough story, they'll buy it. And sometimes they'll give you advice on how to make the story better. Yeah. And you take that, go back to the drawing board, but just don't stop. Get started and don't stop. Right. Got it. Get started, don't stop. Yeah. It still sounds imposing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's it's a, it's a thing. Tell but the thing about it, though, right, is whatever you write about. You have to be passionate about it, right? Sure. You have to know about it, and you have to be passionate about it. Because if you're not passionate about it, then you don't have anything to keep you going. Every time I sat down to write, it was like some outside force was entering my body, flowing through my fingers, and typing. I would sit down for two straight hours, and at no point did I experience writer's block because it was something I knew about, and it was something I was passionate about. So physically, paint, paint the picture for us. Uh, you decide you're going to be a writer. I mean, in your head, did you did you tell yourself you were a writer, and, and or did you have any imposter syndrome or? 
you know, what, what were the what were the mental mechanics here? Your comp your confidence. Anytime you you take on any major uh, uh, endeavor. I mean, unless you unless you just are, you know, you know what's gonna happen, you're gonna have confidence issues. Sure. And I had confidence issues, but the, the, the thing that helped me out is every time I, I wrote in a, a Google Docs, a shared Google Docs, mm -hmm. and I gave six really good friends who I, um, who, whose opinion I trust, I gave them access, just read only access mm -hmm. to the book. And I let them read every chapter, you know, and some of them read, you know, as I wrote, and they kept me going. They said, hey, you know, this is good, this is bad, you know, I don't know, think of something else. And they, they just sort of kept me going. And it's important to keep, in the same way that you want to protect yourself from the negative thoughts, you want to embrace people who not just tell you what you want to hear, right. but give you, you know, constructive feedback mm. on, um, on, on, on your product and what you're putting out there. If they're pushing the rock up the hill with you, not, yeah, exactly. not, not, not in seeding, seeding doubt. Sure. What does the physical space look like? Did you, did you carve something out? And did that change while you write, wrote the book? So it was the, the, my writing space was the world around me. I mean, I, I, I wrote, I physically sat down and wrote for two hours a day, right? But I was really writing for my entire waking, waking hours of the day. I mean, I'm writing in the shower. I'm in the shower. Oh, man, this would be cool if this happened. And then, you know, I'll go to a park and I have my iPad and I'll sit down and write. But most of my writing took place at the, um, in my kitchen, at my desktop, and at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I just sit down and write. Any of you guys want to ask some questions? Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to talk to Drew a little bit before he came on stage. Um, and it's fascinating to see anyone who decides to take this path and, and walk a, a very, very hard road. Um, but I've always been curious how much research goes into a book like this? Like I know you said seven to eight months to actually write everything, but how much time did you start spend actually looking at some of the things that you were talking about to make sure you had it technically right? Absolutely. I spent a lot of time on the Google, right? I, I, was, I spent a lot of time Googling things, and, um, and a good chunk of my day was also spent just sort of you know, a lot of it came from my experiences, right? So I know certain things. You know, there's a whole, probably like a third of the book is, is uh, centered on Afghanistan. Well, I spent years in Afghanistan, so I know about my experience in Afghanistan, so I'm writing about the things that I know about. But sometimes, my, you know, I might have a memory lapse, and I might hop on and, and identify and, 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 and research, um, you know, certain, like maybe the population of, Kandahar Air Base or something like that, um, but it, it took a it took a, a good bit of a good bit of research. I mean, I, sometimes I would I had to write about a. There's a scene in here about a Gulfstream jet. I've never been on a private Gulfstream jet yet, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I had to I had to get on and watch YouTube videos so that I could describe the interior and the specifications. So uh, that's a, an incredible question, but a considerable amount of time. I don't know, but a lot. Hey, Drew. Thanks for joining us this morning. So uh, this, this week we talked a lot about the lack of trust in institutions and the, the crisis um, that's, that's facing our country. Um, and I wonder, as you talk about identity politics and, and um, you know, populations of our of our country voting exclusively with one party and, and how corrosive that is for our society. Yep. I wonder where you view uh, the challenge. Um, you know, we spoke with the, the Gallup CEO this morning and, and he pointed to the media. I wonder what, um, what challenges you see there and what opportunities to, to kind of bridge this gap. What challenges do I see with regard to yeah, so, I mean, the data that we've looked at, whether that was from the Gallup CEO or from, from others, Secretary Hegel talked yesterday a lot about, you know, uh, dissatisfaction and a lack of happiness within our society that divides us. Um, you talked about sort of being divided and, yeah. and, and identity politics having a corrosive uh, effect on our, on our, uh, on our governance. Yeah. Um, I wonder, you know, where you see the, the biggest threat um, to, to our politic writ large and, and what opportunities to solve that? 
Sure, that's an, inc that's an incredible question. I, th I, I think that, with respect to this country, I think that we, we, um, we need to, politicians will, they're beholden to their, their electorate, right? They're beholden to, to their electorate. And I think we need to get to a place where we are, we are voting policy irrespective of party and not the other way around. And so we are in a space where it's where where it's it's a team thing. I am a I am a Republican, and whatever you know, you know I'm going to toe the line. Whatever they say, I'm going to toe the line. Right? I'm a Democrat. Whatever the Democrats say, we're going to toe the line. And we need to get to a point where we're where uh, we're uh, sharing ideas and having actual discourse. And if it makes sense. Just because a Republican introduced it, or just because a Democrat introduced it, then it, it makes sense. Who who cares who introduced it, all right? Um, that's where the divisiveness comes. I don't know where it originated, but I think that's where the divisive, divisiveness comes. And I think that we that's that's the the best way. It's a hard thing, right? It's it's, it's very very difficult when when you see a, a you know a, a person of a party make a divisive statement and you're like, well, I don't like this person because of the comment that he or she made about this particular group. And so because of that, I don't support anything you have to say, irrespective of how reasonable it is. All right? Yeah, and I think um, obviously your sort of creative dealing with this in your in your book is definitely one element of, of kind of healing the divide. I wonder if you could sort of point us in the direction of any other, you know, beacons of hope in, in terms of, of healing that divide. Yeah. Um, I think that politi well, first of all, I think politicians support every vote. They shouldn't, they shouldn't just ignore, I understand, hey, you know, I'm running for Congress in the fourth congressional district in Maryland. Well, I'm gonna look at this turf sheet, this map, and I'm only gonna go to this segment of the population that has historically voted Democrat because I'm a Democrat, right? I get it, strategically that makes sense if you wanna get elected, right? But we need to get to the point where we are courting every vote and meaningfully, you know, not just not just saying things, but meaningfully courting every vote from every segment of the population, and and saying, hey, I am a senator, I am a governor, I am the president of this entire demographic, not just the people of my party. And once we get to that space, right? Once we get to that space, and the people need to hold their politicians to it. But once we get to that space, then um, then we'll have a more constructive. Uh, dialogue and we'll have a more perfect union. Firstly, um, I'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, it really interested me when you said that you wanted to make it a Netflix series. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I might be the youngest guy in the room and um, in, in a lot of ways it feels like TV shows are even becoming this outdated medium. Yeah. And in terms of books, um, there's definitely a lot of challenges that come with it as a medium, especially when it's talking about issues as important as the ones in this book, um, whether that be reaching a younger generation with an attention span of 15 seconds, or we were talking about the rural-urban divide and uh, the lower literacy rates in rural environments who have underserved education funding. Um, how do you deal with those challenges when deciding to write a book as opposed to make a mini-series on Netflix or make a series of YouTube videos or something like that? Yeah, so um, as I said earlier, I, would, I kind of fell into writing this book. I just started writing, right? And eventually I realized, hey, this is a book that I'm writing. And it was something completely under my control. I didn't have to, I didn't have to go out and solicit anything from anybody to write it. I could just sit down and write. And you know, a book came about. It just is happenstance. Had I started writing a script, <laughs> you know, maybe I already have a, a Netflix or Amazon Prime deal or HBO deal. But it just so happened I started writing a book, um, and uh, my goal is to 
put these ideas out there in as many forms as possible so that I could start that discourse among as many people as possible. And the interesting thing is that um, when it comes to streaming, the, sure there's a, um, a divide when it comes to um, Wi-Fi connectivity and internet, but when I go to, I can go to some of the poorest parts of the country, and I've been a lot of places, and everybody, you know, a lot of people, you have have, you know, devices, right, it's everywhere, and you know, so I want you to be able to read it on Netflix. I want you to be able to go to your public library and check this out for free, right? And, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah, you go. I mean, there there is the broader issue there of, um, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we educate the next generations, right? When there seems a propensity, um, you know, or challenge to read. I know I, I have you know two young children, and getting them to read is like pulling teeth, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, getting them away from screens is like pulling teeth. And um, so, know, uh, so I think getting getting. Getting them away from screens is an exercise in futility, right? <laughs> they are going to have yeah. access to, you know, the internet. The key, however, is making sure that of the two hours a day that they're maybe exposed to YouTube or whatever, guiding them in, in a direction. There's, think about it. When we were children, if we wanted to know something, what do we have to do? We had to go look at an encyclopedia, right? We had to go to the library. You know, it wasn't, we couldn't just, if, if you begin to talk to me and you, and you gave me a fact or something that, that you know, and, and you saw my eyebrow raise and I reach into my pocket and I pull something out, I'm fact checking you on the spot. Yeah. Back in the day, you had to, um, you had to take the person's word for it if you didn't care enough to go figure it out yourself. Yeah, well, but I'm, now, I'm not that old, Drew. We had, we had the <laughs> organs trail. <laughs> <laughs> right? But now, now this, you have unlimited access to um, you have unlimited access to information, sure. and a lot of a lot of the younger people are experts at it. It's just a matter of getting them off of TikTok, off of Instagram, you know, for a period sure. of time, and off of them, the mindless scrolling. Right, 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 right. And you can, what, yeah, yeah. What 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 uh what does look looking for a Netflix deal look like? And then is there another book? Sure. Um, looking for it, so because uh, I'm assuming, it, yeah, I mean, that goal still stands, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It comes in many ways. Uh, my publisher. I just had a meeting with my publisher, Sequoia. Thank you, Sequoia and D'Angelo Publications. Um, wonderful, wonderful people there. We just had a meeting with them, and they told me everything I need to do from putting together a one sheet to writing the pilot, and. She's working her angles out in Hollywood. I have other friends out in Hollywood working their angles. I was at Union Market recently having coffee by myself, and there were coincidentally two people sitting directly across from me talking about movie things and TV things, and I interrupted them. Come to find out, they were like big TV people in Hollywood, and yeah. so I, of course, had a copy of my book, which I always keep, signed it over to one of them, and hopefully they'll get back to me. <laughs> well, I, I have no doubt, Drew, and I've, I've seen Drew crisscrossing the country. He has, um, he has a fun Instagram account to watch, so if, you, if you're looking for some, some more mindless scrolling of Drew Bembo uh, hitting, the, hitting the world, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. he's, he's always entertaining. I think I missed a question. Yes, sir. What is the Insta, Drew? Oh, drewbenbow.com, and uh, if you want to hashtag today's event, it's the <laughs> devil's politics. Hashtag the devil's politics. Thank you. Of course. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Gino. I'm also one of the protégés here, and uh, Justin kind of stole my question. So my follow-up question is uh, for any uh, readers or hopefully for the TV audience who are not really familiar with the uh, topic that you're trying to cover, what are you hoping to be the biggest takeaway? Let's say people who don't understand uh, much about the themes like race and politics and how sensitive it is. And obviously it takes a while to really take it all down. So for you, uh, your readers and audience for watching your show, hopefully one day or reading the book. Sure. And see, 
thank you very much, Gino. That's the reason I, I created art, right? Because when you create art, you, when you create art, you know, the goal is to make it uh, understandable for for everybody. You're going to inter- so I spent 20 years in the army. I'm a retired major from the army. Now I know that the average person is not going to understand sit rep or you know whatever lingo that we use in the military. Um, so I had to figure out a way to um, I had to figure out a way to you know relate that to to, to everyone. And so that's the, that's the whole idea behind art. But the behind the my art and this, that's the goal. Is this also where your six fellow writers came in? They're like, what the, the yeah, heck and is so, this? And, yeah, and that's <laughs> interesting, right? Right, yeah. because you know they came from. They're not, they were just my beta readers, is what they call them right. in the literary world. And these, they were able to come in and say, I don't understand. I don't understand what you mean when you say this. Or I don't understand. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess that's a, that's a legal term of art. That's a, a military term of art. So I go back and I... You're like calling things fobs. And yeah, <laughs> calling it fob, right, right, or defect, dining facility, yeah. right? So I had to go back and... Um, and uh, and, and make those changes based on their feedback. And of course, there were quite a few editors along the way. Ashley Krantis, incredible, you know, bunch of other people who uh, who were able to guide me in that way to make sure that I wasn't, you know, talking to a very one specific audience in a way that other people, other readers, would understand. Uh, hi, Mr. Benbo. Thanks for coming out and speaking to us. Um, I found like I actually also deployed to Afghanistan, I also went to law school, yep. I also one day want to write a book, so yep. a lot of what you've been talking about has been really enjoyable for me to listen to, really yep. inspiring as well. Um, I guess what I wanted to ask is, uh, you made an interesting comment about how you write at two or three in the morning, yep. which is like, I, I really identified with, because I yeah. feel like a lot of times that's also like my most creative time. Um, and so, I, I thought about something else too. Hemingway had always said, write drunk, edit sober, yeah. <laughs> right? And so I think, I, I guess what my question is for you is like, what is your creative process like? What do you, what, what do you find stimulates you, right? Um, I mean, writing like that late at night or early in the morning, um, but what are some other things that really just like get your flow going is, um, since, you know, you said that you never really have writer's block, right? And that's sure. something that's pretty significant. Sure, I think, um just paying attention to the world. So there are different ways to write a book. You have some people who have the brain where they can write an outline and they know everything that's going to happen from beginning to the end because they have a, an outline. I can't use an outline. When I was writing, that was politics. Imagine there was a, a building that, ex- that extended from this wall to that wall. And each in, on the interior of that building, there were doors that, leads, that led to another door, that led to another closed door. Well, I didn't know what was happening on the other side of that door until I got to the door and opened it. And I didn't know what was happening on the other side of that door, so on and so forth. And um, also just paying attention. There were things that happened in the devil's politics that, that I discovered the day of, right? I, was, I might have been watching a movie or listening to the news and something happened and it triggered a thought. And I'm like, wow, that'd be a really cool direction to take the book. So just for me, being open and not being so rigid in, in how you, and what you're thinking in the direction of the book. Stephen King, uh, he says that the one thing you need to know about when you're writing a book is how it ends. Well, I didn't even know that. Right? I had no idea how the book was going to end until I got to the end of the book, or maybe a couple chapters before the end of the book. Well, thank you for the question. And Drew, uh, you know, still mind blown, I'm not gonna lie, the book is terrific, and um, Drew will be on hand uh, signing copies of books. I'm gonna go ahead and cover half the cost for any of our protégés, so I I think that makes it a very uh, uh, affordable, I don't know, 13 or $14 signed book with some conversation from Drew, but you're, you're a rising rock star, uh, realizing your pathway, and it, we're just really excited that you were able to join us today and that we get to be part of that, and um, so excited for the next chapter. Well, thank you very much, and th- Justin, um, and thank everyone for, for being here and all the 
very smart, incredible questions. Uh, this is a beautiful experience for me, and I'm happy to know you as a friend, and thank you for having me. Of course. All right. Thank you.